come to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue our study of Daniel chapter 11, verses 4 to 6. See if we can place these on a line, see if this makes any sense at all. And um, <clears throat> so we need to pray and ask for God's blessing. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we can be gathered together to open your word. And we are thankful for the light that we have received for our feet and for the strength that you give us each day uh, to continue to walk this path. I pray for each person who is studying and searching these things out, that they can receive <clears throat> this light, that um, it can show us our sins, our need of you, our dependence upon you, and that you can be glorified in all things. Be with us now as we open your word together. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> uh, well, good morning again, everyone. And um, so as we started to move past um, uh, Daniel 11, verse 2, and to look at uh, Alexander's kingdom, um, um, so I guess technically we're studying Daniel 11, verse 3 to 6 is what we're, we're addressing here. <clears throat> so this mighty king, of course, we know is Alexander. So that's verse 3. A mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and shall do according to his will. And he becomes a type. This according to his will, this idea is uh, first shown in Daniel chapter 8 regarding um, <clears throat> Persia, right? So if we go to Daniel chapter 8, um, <clears throat> uh, in verse 4, right, this ram that's pushing westward, northward, southward, um, he did according to his will and became great. So this idea doing according to his will, we attach to the law of the Medes and the Persians. That is, uh, this is a counterfeit of God's law, or at least a parallel to God's law. Obviously, we see it in the American Constitution, so it's not necessarily always a bad thing, but it does become perverted. And so in Daniel chapter 11, we see the same characteristic he does according to his will. <clears throat> and we also see this in verse uh, um, verse was it? Let's see it. Yeah, verse 16. He does according to his own will, right? Um, now, this, of course, here is referring to Rome, right? So we're going to see it with Medo-Persia. We're going to see it with Greece. Then we see it with Rome. And then we see it with Papal Rome in verse 36. The king shall do according to his will, right? So we see this thread moving through these different kingdoms. But by the time it gets to the papacy, this has to do with making laws that are contrary to God's law. And um, <clears throat> so we can see that this character exists in Greece and um, it's, it's, uh, it's one of the ways that we can understand um, uh, this role of Alexander as we start to look at these different way marks Let's put it this way. As we look at these different way marks, as we parallel these histories, we're going to see a number of different things. We're going to see uh, floods, um, uh, which are symbols of the Sunday law. We're, we're going to see lots of symbols. They keep getting repeated, right? Uh, their arm, um, uh, they're becoming, becoming great, right? So all of these types of things. And what we're saying is that Daniel chapter 11 is, is repeating the same history over and over again. So this is something we well understood for a long time, but how to place that together. And so when we studied 
the kings of Persia. Um, you know, Persia is Persia. Persia, it does not include Greece. So one of the things that Colin presented on December 25th, 2021, was that Alexander uh, ends up typifying Trump, which uh, doesn't make sense because we would now have a new line. So we have this line of Persia with these kings, and then we have Greece. Now, Greece comes into play because when Xerxes stirs up all against the realm of Grecia, he's going to lose to Greece. So now we're at Greece. And, and, and we're going to first look at Alexander's kingdom and how it's divided and ask if that can be drawn on a line itself. And then we're going to, you know, move to that division of the kingdom and see how it develops. How do we draw that on a line? How do we, and more specifically, because we know Daniel chapter 11 from a historical point of view, how do we apply these histories in connection with um, our history, our time? So Angela has... Uh, um, I don't know it. Dio Volante, God willing, and and Shala according to Allah's will. So you're saying that. Um, so Andrew just makes a note according to his will or his own will. Uh, so there's some. Uh, there must be a Catholic thing. Dio vol Volante, God willing, and and Shala, which is a Muslim expression according to Allah's will. So what are you trying to say there, Angela, about these? Wills. Well, I just said there's kind of kind of a parallel there between according to his own will, and then I thought I I often through my life have used the expression DV. Maybe it is Catholic, but it's a really good expression. And then I've heard my Arab friends say inshallah, you know, they're talking about their plans. So oh. it sort of fits. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It sort of fits. I mean, the main thing that I'm saying here with the will is this has to do with law, right? That is uh, either, you know, God's law or perversion of law that, that that's occurring with these different powers. Now, the law of the Medes and Persians, we parallel with the American Constitution. So the American Constitution, um, when we think of the word will, you know, we can think of it as a covenant, right? A person has their will and testament, um, you know, that they write. And then, you know, when they die, it's supposed to be enacted. Um, but these are types of covenants. And um, so, so doing according to his will. This is obviously these kings have powers um, to do what they want to do, right? even if it's in opposition to God. Um, so just to review these verses before we start drawing them on a line. Um, so we have Alexander, and we're saying that he's paralleling the papacy during the 1260 years. And so we can place this uh, breaking up his, of, of his kingdom as the time of the end. Now, of course, that's 1798, but it is also 1989. And so we have uh, things that we can look at that can help us understand this is 1989. Now, we looked at verse 6, and we, we have that connected to 9-11. But why do, we, why do we place this at 1989? The kingdom being divided to the four winds of heaven. Aside from the fact that we're saying Alexander's rule parallels the papal rule. Well, I can see the parallel between the fourth verse and, and the breakup of, of the Soviet Union. 
Mm-hmm. You could say the arm curtain was tattered at that point or broken. Okay. Yeah, so so we can we can see the parallel between the breaking of these kingdoms, the Soviet Union. Um I mean it's it's Daniel eleven verse forty, right? We can look at what happened in 1798 and 1989. We can see that they are parallel. And um, so we can see that this breaking up of Alexander's kingdom also becomes parallel, right? So it just illustrates that history. They're, They're different powers. And here in this time, in our time, if we're applying this to 1989, we can see that that the Soviet Union is a dragon power. It's a globalist power, right? And one of the things that Jeff addressed um, in connection with November 9th, um, the Penaeum and Rafi and all of these things, was we had this belief that the Soviet Union just fell in 1989, and that was the end of it, which, which was kind of a problem in a sense because we know that that power still exists, right? The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Um, so when we came to realize that that it only went up to the neck and that the head survived, Jeff had made this um, suggestion um, that uh, the head was um, Moscow, right? So that Russia really was this same power, that it wasn't really destroyed. And the problem with that, of course, was Russia was no longer an atheistic power, is no longer an atheistic power. It's it's once again uh, embraced um, Russian Orthodox, you know, the Orthodox religion, right? So, so it's a religious power, it's not an atheistic power. And we can see then that all that happened is that power that moved from first it was, you know, in France in 1798, then it was in the USSR, Uh, but it's still going to continue. It's going to be uh, moved to the UN, right? So, So the UN takes over that role that globalist role. And in a sense, it was always kind of there in the background, um, you know, being formed and, and uh, manipulated. So I don't think that we can just, you know, we can say that Russia has this part to play. And um, it's definitely not the dragon power anymore, but it was. Right, the Soviet Union was. So now we're looking at the UN. So we're not talking about Russia and, and you know battles between the King of the North and the King of the South between the United States and Russia as having a part in Bible prophecy at this point. Right. So that <clears throat> so if we're going to make this this. Uh, illustration here at 1989, um, we can see that the kingdom is broken, but it's still going to survive, right? And and it's going to survive. Um, uh, first, we're going to have the king of the south shall be strong, right? And so we're going to have this battles between north and south. And so that has to be illustrating our history since 1989. Okay, so what else can help us establish this as 1989? So the kingdom's going to be broken. It's going to be divided towards the four winds of heaven. Okay, anybody? 
Um, how are we going to to establish this? Okay, so we got, we have the time of the end, right? So we're going to say this is the time of the end. Is there anything else in this verse uh, that can help us see this, or, these, or even in these verses, but specifically in this verse? This verse meaning which? Verse 4. His kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. Okay. When we're when we're looking at this, are we agreed that verses three and four are in a manner of speaking paired together? Well, yes, they're they're paired together. So we have the fall of we have we have the history of Alexander, which we're going to parallel to um, the events that are going to happen uh, before 1989. So it's going to lead us to 1989. Okay. <clears throat> so when we're looking at this, and I, re I recognize I'm, I'm stepping back just a little bit to answer your question. Daniel 11.3 the translators would have combined 11.3 with Daniel 7.6 and Daniel 8.5, right? Um, yeah. So we have a firm identification that 11.3 begins where this mighty king that's being described gives us a good identification for Alexander. Yeah. <clears throat> now, when we look at this, this third descriptive, because we have a mighty king standing up, descriptive one, yeah. rule with great dominion, two, yeah. and do according to his will is three. Mm-hmm. But that portion of this verse, the translators would have combined it with Daniel 8, 4, 11, 16, and 11, 36. And we have, within the movement, always looked at 11, 16, and 11, 36 as being descriptive of that of the the very end powers rome rome well, yeah so we have rome enters with that characteristic and of course the papacy with that characteristic so it exists in Medo persian exists in greece um but it just keeps multiplying i guess uh increasing as we move towards the papacy right exactly now <clears throat> When we're looking at 11.4, and when he shall stand up, the he in this is giving us a, a description first of Alexander. Mm -hmm. Now, when it says that the kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, we're talking about a kingdom that is all over the world dispersed. Would that right. be a fair statement? Yeah. So it just, it's going in the directions of the compass. So it's, it's towards the four winds of heaven. That's going to be the world. And, and we know that the four winds, they're talked about as winds of destruction as well, right? That, and they're going to be held back. So in our history, the four winds have, have a part to play as well. 
But here it's you know, primarily referring to the directions of the compass, but it does become a symbol. Okay, now here again, translators would have combined this portion with Daniel 8.8. 8. Um, yeah, so they're going to be going to um, just dealing with Greece, right? So the great horn. So this is going to end the, that's going to be Alexander's kingdom. And then the four notable ones for the four winds of heaven. So there's going to be lots of different people vying for control of, of Alexander's kingdom, but it's going to use four notable ones. And that notable ones is this word, look, of striking appearance. So these are the ones that are are going to be the ones that we note, right? there. Um, and, and so we have east, west, no, north, and south, these kingdoms. Um, but, but obviously the ones that are going to be discussed in Daniel chapter 11 are just the king of the north and the king of the south. We're not going to say anything about um, uh, the east and the west. Okay, but what we have here, <clears throat> symbolically using Daniel 8.8 8, and the verbiage that is in Daniel 8.8 8, and 11.4. Yeah. Is, is this not a doubling? Well, because of 8.8? 8? I'm saying the 8.8 8 and the verbiage of the two verses. Okay, where's the dub doubling in the verbiage? <clears throat> okay, if I read Daniel 8.8, 8, therefore the he-goat waxed very great, mm -hmm. and he was strong. The great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And then in 11.4, and when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken, and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven, and not to his posterity, nor according to the dominion which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for those beside those. Okay, so you're saying the verses say the same thing, so that's right. a doubling. I'm asking if that's a doubling, yeah. Okay, well, I don't know if you, if, if we pair two verses together that say the same thing, um, I don't know. Uh, we're pairing two verses together, so they're doubled. But uh, so there's no doubling within the verse itself. Just that we have two verses that are telling the same story in in different language. This one in 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 eight eight, and more in symbolic language uh, than in eleven uh, four. Well. 8.8 eight is the first occurrence. Yeah. And then there's further information that's being revealed in 11.4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's a repeat because this is telling the same story um, in a different way than it is in chapter 8. Because obviously what we see here in chapter 11 at the beginning is paralleled in chapter 8 because this is the transition of these two kingdoms. They're looking at it from a different perspective. More and one is Daniel eleven is more literal than it is in chapter eight. Right. right. See East representing these kingdoms. We're just directly talking about these kings, the kings of Persia, and then this mighty king Alexander, right? And what happens to his kingdom. So um, are we yeah. Are we dealing yet in this portion with a description of the king of the north? Um, no. Why? Because the king of the north doesn't come till later. That's going to be... Uh, When I'm when I'm looking at the next verse that comes up, it says, "And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes." So mm -hmm. I'm asking here, since this is not yet introducing the king of the south, 
but yet in the in the following verse we we do see its introduction whether right. or not this is giving us a description of the king of the north well we get a description of the king of the north in verse six so i don't see so i'm not i'm not sure i understand your question you're saying is is what describing the king of the north in verse four you're saying when he shall stand up when i'm when i'm looking at this i'm having to ask if the verses that we are reading verses one through four are giving us a description of those that would be considered the king of the north and then by 11 5 we get the introduction of the concept of the king of the south okay i think i understand what you're saying but i'd have to say no if i understand what you're saying so because we're making an application to our time, right? So Persia is describing our history in relationship to the kings of Persia. Now, can we say that this is describing the king of the north in verses, verse 2, right? If we go back verse 1 verse, to verse 2, yes. Now, we could also say that verse 3 is introducing the eighth, the papacy again, right? You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, I'm, if we I'm wanted to saying. connect verse, if we wanted to connect verse three to verses one and two, we would have Revelation 17 describing the period of time from Reagan all the way to the eighth, which is the beast that was and is not, that shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And we can parallel Alexander to the papacy rising after the kings, the seven kings, right? Okay, continue. So now we also can parallel this mighty king that stands up. We can parallel him to uh, the globalists as well. Because in our history, you know, we have this issue where Xerxes is defeated by Greece. So, so if we wanted to connect these verses in that way, we could. And then we, we would take verse four and we would say, well, this is then the destruction of the papacy. The problem with that is that we have clearly a line of these seven kings, right? Even though here it doesn't include all those kings, we attack it to Revelation 17, and we can create those seven kings, the presidents of the United States. And we know that Xerxes is going to be defeated by the globalists. So really the last two kings are under this globalist rule or um, league, right? So, so you could take this mighty king and you could apply it in that. But here, we're actually starting a new line. And the way that we're applying this, we're saying that this mighty king that stands up is at the time of the end, not at some future time um, after 1989, that this is 1989. And the king that's standing up here is the USSR, right? This is this, this his, the kingdom that's being destroyed or broken is the Soviet Union being divided towards the four winds of heaven. So we think the Soviet Union has fallen, right? And that's the end of this globalist power, right? Which is symbolized by Greece. But we know that it's not the end because we still have, you know, the, the UN, right? So it's the globalist power. And so if we're going to, to apply this, we have to recognize then what happens with the king of the south. And we, we established that, um, that the king of the south is established after the fall of the Soviet Union. That is, the UN gains new powers with the fall of the Soviet Union. Right? And then it's going to, it says, in the, in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. 
for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north. So we discussed this as far as, well, this is a woman, right? This is Berenice in this case. And she's the daughter of the king of the south. And she's going to make a league with the king of the north, right? Or she shall the, make, what's that? Or is the king of the south making the league by allowing his daughter to be married to the king of the north? Right. Yeah, exactly. So, but it's it's through this through this woman, right? So, whoever this daughter represents, it, it's some kind of church. Right. And, it, and it's going to make this league. So so it's it's a league between the king of the north and the king of the south. And, and so how do we understand this in our line? That's kind of what we're trying to to do. We're saying now we, we connected this to 2001 to spiritual formation, at least within the church itself, that this is a type of league. Right. And, and the king of the north here. Um, is well that's that's the protestants that's protestant america but how do we understand this if this you know has protestant america has made a league um with spiritualism right and so we, we talked about the fact that you know what we see in christianity today is really spiritualism right Protestants have continued to fall, and uh, Protestants don't know anything about the papacy. But more than that, their whole religious practice is purely spiritualistic. It's not according to God's word. So how we're understanding this, we still haven't really sorted out all the details. But we can say verse 4 is 1989 and verse 6 is 2001. That's that's what we've suggested that is how we're going to look at this. Okay, so how else could we do this? How, how how else can we establish what we're trying to establish? Well, I've been thinking about this for most of the last day. Okay. Still... There's just still quite a few questions. I mean, I, I was presenting what I was seeing in okay. election four. You and I don't agree on that at this point. Mm -hmm. But you're you have you have a valid premise. So I want to see some more as to how this is going to play out. Yeah, yeah, because I, I think I understand what you're trying to say here. But I think we have to separate these these uh sections well the main the main reason i was looking at this with 11 4 as beginning with the king of the north is that when we're tying in with it some of the other verses that that come later it leads us it segues easily into you know what what the papacy would be doing at the very end because we know that the the rule of the papacy is going to be universally broken at the end. We know that it is coming up differently from from the other beasts because it's not like the the great beast that we've used as a descriptor of the United States, where it comes up out of the earth, out of the land, because all of the others come up out of the sea. So. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, kind of myopic here, but 
when I look at this, what I see is just we're repeating the same history of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. That's our history. And, and so this is going to bring us to each time it's going to go through that history. It's going to start at 1989. So where when we were studying judges, we really started uh, 2001 to 2023. Though sometimes the lines brought us back to 1989 because there's a parallel between November 9th, 1989 and uh, November 9th, uh, 2019. So it's going to bring us up into our history as well. So when we're looking at times of our history, we can also see the parallels with 1989. Um, but here, I think Daniel 11 is repeating, re-repeating in its history, all that happens in verse 40 to 45. That is, verse 40 to 45 is a repeat of all of this history. And so we can go back and look at this history and get more details for our time. And so we did that with the kings of Persia, right? So I think we've established that, that, um, that the detail that we've, we've gotten from what Colin directed us to, um, that I think we've solved what that is, and that it's pointing us now to look further in Daniel to see this. And, and we, without what we, with what we did in Judges, if we hadn't done that in Judges, I don't think we could look at Daniel 11 and understand it. So, you know, God directed us after December 25th, 2021, uh, to do the study of understanding the lines, right? We're going to begin that on December 26th, 2021. We're going to start looking at understanding the lines. So if we hadn't done that, we can't do what we're doing now. And so I'm trying to bring what we did with judges into this. So that's why I guess I'm stuck on this model. I hope that makes sense, that I'm using judges as like a template for us studying Daniel chapter 11, which is a bit different approach than what we had done before. And, and some of the things we're looking at here are like the symbols of the numbers, either the verse numbers or the Hebrew Strong's numbers. Um, but we're also dealing with the symbolism itself. So we, we look at according to his will, we can see that that's repeated. So, yes, so Daniel 11 verse 4 is Daniel 8.8, 8, right? That's really clear. It's it's talking about exactly the same uh, the same thing, but explaining it in different terms. Okay. Right? We don't have horns here, you know, coming up. Right. It's not talking about horns. It's talking about, um, you know, it's divided to the four winds. It doesn't say anything about horns coming up. But it says not to his posterity nor according to his dominion which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. So, so his kingdom is taken over. And, and this is obviously, you know, pointing ultimately to the end of what's going to happen with his kingdom is that it's going to be plucked up by the king of the north, which is going to be the papist in this case. But, but, but there's a process in which that occurs, which is what the rest of Daniel is showing. Because what Daniel 11 is showing here from verse 4 all the way to, we can say, verse 31, if we wanted to go there, is that it's the transition from Greece to Rome, right? But it doesn't happen just like that, right? When Greece, um, you know, rises, it's going to have this, with Alexander, this immediate fracturing. But that fracturing is going over time to develop into the fact that that kingdom is going to be taken over by Rome. But each of these histories, 
Persia, right? Greece, even Rome, all of them are to have histories that parallel 1989 to the Sunday law. Correct? <clears throat> all right, agreed. Okay. So, so that's the premise that I'm working on and how I'm trying to look at this. So I'm not trying to connect Persia and Greece as all representing the king of the north. Um, but I understand, I think, what, what you're trying to say. But I want to break this into sections more, more specifically. Okay. okay. Um, okay. So if we're going to say that this is 1989... We have the fact that a kingdom is broken. So that's the Soviet Union. Um, it's divided towards the four winds of heaven. That's its universal nature, right? So when that kingdom is fractured, when the Soviet Union is fractured, it doesn't end the king of the south or spiritualism. It doesn't end that those characteristics. Those characteristics survive, and they have been developing all through that history with the UN. But the UN now takes on this role as globalists. Right. And then we're going to have the king of the south. So the king of the south is a certain aspect of the kingdom. That is, it's, it's atheistic and licentious, worldly, secular aspect, which is the UN. But the king of the south is going to make a league through this daughter of the king of the south with the king of the north and we know that the king of the north in 1989 is who in 89 it'd be rome well well no the king of the north as far as when we're looking at yes so in a sense rome but in daniel 11 verse 40 the king of the north uses the united states Right? The King of the North uses United States as its army, yes. Right. And and so in that sense, Jeff has taught that the King of the North is the United States. The King of the South was the Soviet Union. Because those are going to be the military powers that are going to be operating. But yes, the United States has a league with Rome. But it's going to be acting in this defeat of the Soviet Union. So it becomes the king of the North in that sense, right? So we're not gonna be looking at the papacy as a power as the king of the North in 1989 or in 2001, right? So, so we need to establish that the king of the North is the US. And Jeff was saying, well, the king of the north is the U.S. and the king of the south is the Soviet Union. And after that, it's going to be Russia. But the thing is, Russia doesn't retain the characteristics of being the king of the south. That goes to the U.N. That goes to the globalists. So in 2001, you know, the king of the south is not Russia. It has to be the globalists. Now, in a spiritual sense, it's all of those things that the King of the South stands for. So there is the King of the South has a daughter that is a church. Well, this church can't be the papacy, right? Correct. So it has to be some kind of some kind of religious power. That's going to make a league with the king of the north, with the United States. Now, we can just say in the broadest sense, this is that Protestantism in the time from 1989 and onward and even before. But Protestantism, which had become part of Babylon in Millerite history, Ellen White says that this is going to be progressive. Its fall is progressive and that the Protestants... Um, have a more complete fall in connection with the events at the end of the world. Specifically, of course, when we get to the Sunday. But Protestantism has become spiritualism. 
Protestant churches are not Bible-based, studying God's word, understanding Bible prophecy. There are all kinds of spiritualistic ideas and concepts, philosophies um, that really are embraced by the Protestant world. The Protestants don't know the Bible. They don't understand Rome. You know, for the most part, there are Protestants who still exist, but I'm just saying as, as a body. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is connected with this in 2001 when it makes a league with the King of the South, right? Now, the United States is paralleled with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That is, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to some degree, parallels the United States. We see that with um, uh, understanding the external in the internal, because we have Judah, right? That's going to be the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we have Israel, which is going to be the United States, right? So these two are, are parallel to each other. And that's why we can look at uh, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah and pair them with these presidents of the United States, the way that Colin did. And, and that's extremely valid uh, point that he made, right? So we, we can parallel these things. But that brings us to our time, right? trying to say that that's always going to continue past where we've paralleled doesn't make sense. But anyway, that's sort of a whole other aside. But at this point, we have to say that this league that's being made is happening in 2001. And it's, it's characterized for us by September 11th, 2001. So that's where we would symbolically place it. And then we had here the end of years. So in Daniel 11, verse 6, I know we're jumping ahead. We'll get back to verse 4. But when we looked at those Hebrew numbers, 7093 and 8141, what did we find? Do you remember from yesterday? So we connected them to September 11th, and what did they show us? So if we count from September 11th, um, um, 7,093 days, we come to uh, Stephen Jameson's 52nd birthday, right? So that's going to be February 11th, 2021. So that's 18,993 days from his birthday. Um, and we know that from Stephen Jameson's birth to September 11th is 11,900 days. It's that symbol of 9-11 or 11-9. And it's also um, uh, you know, the number between the Islamic calendar, 32 years and seven months, where the Islamic calendar comes in line again with the, the solar year. And then we have his 52nd birthday, and we know the 52nd birthday, 52 by times um, 360 is 18720. Um, so if you have 52 prophetic years, it's going to be uh, 273 days less than 52 solar years, right? So 18993 days is 52 solar years, 187 to zero days is 52 um, prophetic years. And the difference is 273, right? So, so we have those symbols attached to it. So, so Stephen Jameson is attached to this. Uh, the symbols that are connected with him are attached to this number. So that's going to be the word that's end. And then when we count 841, so the word years, shana, eight, 8141 in Hebrew, Strong's numbers, and we we count uh, those, it's going to bring us to December 25th, 2023, if we do an ordinal count. So, so that's still a future date, December 25th, 2023, but it's a symbolic date. Right? So... So we know we've already had 
uh, two December 25ths in, in just in the last two years. They're both significant in relationship to understanding what we're understanding. So I know that may be a little bit esoteric, but that's what we did in the book of Judges. We took these numbers. Uh, and so this end of years, in the end of years, points us to 9-11 plus the verse itself, 11-6. If we just flip it over, you know, end to end, the six turns into a nine and it's 9-11, right? So it's pointing us to September 9th or September 11th, uh, 2001. So that's going to connect to Stephen's birthday as well as the 800 or the 793 days. Okay. And, and also the symbol for July 18, 2020 comes out of that as well. And then we get the years. That's going to give us this December 2015. Any thoughts on that? It's intriguing the number of links that you have there with Stephen's birthday. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, we've already, before we even looked at this, we had suggested that it's going to do this, that these verses are going to give us our history. So uh, to me, it seems that we kind of have to accept uh, what's happening here. Um, now, um, now, what about the four winds? Okay, so let's just look at verse four, where it talks about the four winds. Now, it says toward the four winds. Now, which is kind of weird, um, because we have... A, a verb here, sort of. Um, and then it has four winds. Now, notice there's no Hebrew number for the word towards. So, obviously, in Hebrew, it shall be divided. Now, they could have maybe put this in italics because there's no Hebrew word for it. Um, and when you look at four winds, it's just going to be four winds. It's just going to be Arba Ruach, right? So, just four winds. And um, so when we look at this here, you're going to see it's, it's obviously not as simple as that. Um, uh, um, so here we got, I'm looking in the wrong verse, that's why. Um, so you're going to see these numbers here, Arba 702 and 7307. So in the Hebrew, um, you're going to see it's it's got the the T there, or the two there. It's it's a lamid, so it's an L sound. Uh, so that's where we get to. That's where we get towards, right? So there isn't a separate Hebrew word, but it is a prefix to the word for. So the word for, or arba, the number four, has a lamid attached to it, the letter L. So it's towards. So that usually means like against um, uh, or to, to the four winds, if we wanted to give it a direct translation. And ruach here is, of course, in the plural feminine. Um, so you've got the four winds. So what about these four winds do we need to note as far as Placing it in 1989. What does this do?
Well, okay, since we're dealing with 11.4, and the premise is to place this in 1989, mm-hmm. how are we noting someone standing up in 1989? Well, it says, when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. So um, as far as the Soviet Union is doing, what's, what is it doing in that history? They don't have to have it exactly in the year 1989, but in connection with that history preceding 1989. What's the Soviet Union doing? Well, if, if you're preceding 1989, mm-hmm. they've been involved in the war in Afghanistan at that point for about 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the war in Afghanistan and that's going to be largely the whole, um, I guess, catalyst, whatever you want to say for what's going to happen in, in the eighties with Reagan and uh, the Pope, Pope John Paul II. Right. All right. Right. So, so the Soviet Union is being fairly aggressive in that history. Now, why are they fighting in Afghanistan? What, I mean, they're just fighting for poppies. What's going on there? Why do we have a war in Afghanistan? <laughs> I thought that they were they were attempting to end the issues that that had occurred within the Soviet Union with islam okay okay so so the united states is also fighting there right so they have they have a proxy war going on right okay would we agree with that is there is this the u.s involved in what's happening in afghanistan Well, if if it's, I know it's it's a very complicated history. Yes, it is. Uh, I'm trying to simplify it in you know a few sentences. So, um, so technically, you know, this war it says here it's going to be really from 79 to 89, December 24th, 1979, to February 15th, 1989, is how they have the Afghan-Soviet war, according to Wikipedia. So, um, How many days is that? Um, well, it's going to be uh, less than 10 years. It's, it's really about... Uh, um, so if it's starting in December, yeah, it's just over nine years, um, and seven, eight weeks. Um, I guess I can figure this out here. So if we go. Yeah, that's going to be 3,340 days. Game. Okay. 111 prophetic months and uh, 10 prophetic days. Um. I don't know. That means anything. Usually we take this 11, 11 to represent uh, January 11th as a symbol. Um,
Okay, so I'm just looking at here. Sorry about this, I have to. Hmm. It's kind of interesting. Um, so just dealing with the four wins. So if you look at the number of days, um, uh, I don't know. No. Um, so these number of days, the number of days is um, 3607 from, um, I'm just going from the beginning of that war to the, to the Berlin Wall falling. So, so you're going to have from the time. Okay, let's look at it this way. So from the time of the start of the Afghan uh, Soviet War um, to the end of it is 3,340 days, and then it's going to be 267 days to the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the 267. What would that symbol be? I know it's it's a little bit it's not as clear maybe as it could be. But 267 days. And and altogether it's 3,607 days to November 9th, 1989. Okay, so <clears throat> the application that you're placing with this in support of your premise that this is describing the king of the south. Um, is that the Soviet Union is standing up by 1989. Okay. No, I'm not saying that this is the Soviet Union stand. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, but I wouldn't call it the King of the South. So, but I'm, I'm this is the Soviet to... Union, but the Soviet Union, because what we're doing is we're paralleling it. So, I, I'm not going to place the Soviet Union as the King of the South in this narrative yet. Right. I'm saying there is a parallel between the fall of the Soviet Union, between the Pope being taken captive in February 15th, note that date, uh, 1798, and also um, uh, what happens with the breaking up of Alexander's kingdom. Okay. So Alexander's kingdom is the globalists. So we would just say the globalists. Because if we put it in as the king of the south, that becomes confusing. Because the king of the south as a symbol is not going to be introduced till verse 5. Okay, but I'm, I'm already getting confused because, okay. I mean, the, the premise that, that I asked about to begin with was that 11.4 was describing the king of the north, not the king of the south. And you said that you disagreed with this right. word, supporting... So that it was the king of the south. Yes. So no, that's not what it's. It's not what I said. What I said is it doesn't describe the king of the north. It doesn't describe the king of the north or the king of the south. Verse five is going to introduce the king of the south. So what I'm saying is we can't be using the terminology king of the north, king of the south, with the fall of the Soviet Union. Right now. I know it's confusing, but let's let's just look at it again. So we're saying that 1989 parallels 1798. So if we're doing that and we're looking at that broad picture, well, yes, we're taking Daniel 11, verse 40, and we're, we have this battle between the king of the north and the king of the south there, right? 
I'm listening. Yep, so we have 1798, 1989. But if we're looking at this verse, verse four, and we're talking about the Soviet Union, if we start talking about this being the king of the South, even though that's true in that other context, right? Right, when we when we bring it to 1989, at this point, we're not, it, it's going to confuse us if we still then talk about the king of the South in verse five, because this is the characteristic that's going to be carried on. So I could say yes and no, maybe that's the best way to say it, but I don't want to confuse it by saying that this is the king of the South here. In this history, Alexander is not the king of the South. He's the king of Greece. And and the Soviet Union, yes, it is the king of the South. So maybe, maybe what you're saying is right. But it's definitely not the king of the North, because the king of the North is, is the U.S., right? Combined with the papacy. They are a unit together in 1989. Okay. So... But, but the question is, how do we place this at 1989? So we have a number of things, and one of them just slipped my mind. What was I doing? Oh, it's the February 15th date. Right. right. So we had in connection so, with... So, Brother Theodore, you saying the king of South is not Russia? No. no. Well, not now. Right? But But the thing is, we're mixing up two different stories. So let's try to... <laughs> Keep the story straight. So we have here the fall of Alexander's kingdom. Obviously, Alexander isn't the king of the South in his history. He has all of Greece. But he does represent the globalists, which do represent the king of the South in our history. Right. But we'll just let's just deal with this Afghan war. So the Afghan war is uh, going to begin. I guess technically it's on December 24th. Right? Is that what they said? It's what you read from Wikipedia. Yeah. So it's going to start on uh, December 24th, 1979. So one day before December 25th. And it's going to go to February 15th, 1989. Um, it's also interesting. It's nine years, one month, and three weeks. You got 391 plus one day. So if we count like the whole first day, it's December 25th, right? But never mind. You know, we can see that it's, it depends how you count it too, right? But nine years, one month, three weeks, one day. Okay. So I'm not sure how they're, okay, I see what they're doing. Anyway, but we have this February 15th date. Now this February 15th date is 267 days before November 9th, 1989. So obviously we know the fall of the Soviet Union is connected with what happens with the war in Afghanistan, right? It's all connected. There's a complicated history of, of how that war occurred. Um, and it's a proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union, right? It says that on Wikipedia. That's what we've understood. So the United States is fighting in that war against the Soviet Union, but they're not in full war against the Soviet Union. They do it as a proxy war. Right. And it says here in Wikipedia, the Soviet Afghan war caused grave destruction throughout Afghanistan and has also been cited by scholars as a significant factor that contributed to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, formally ending the Cold War. Right. So there's all kinds of things in this history that um, that we would need to look at. You know, we know about Leonid, Leonid Brezhnev, right? Um, he's um, he launched an invasion of Afghanistan to support the local pro-Soviet government that had been installed during Operation Storm 333. So there's there's all these things that were happening at the start of this war uh, going through how this war led to the fall of the Soviet Union. So, so we can definitely take that war in Afghanistan as part of the fall of the Soviet Union, right? It's connected to it. So we can, we can add that history into this line. 
And, and that would be the mighty king standing up, right? That's what we're saying. It's just the Soviet Union is, is standing up. It's arising. It's, it's seeking to conquer territory like the, like was happening with, um, with Alexander. And it's going to lead to its dissolution. And it's going to be on February 15th. So we can, we can parallel that 15th in 1989 to the February 15th in 1798, right? And then we have the 267 days then before 9 11. Now, 267 as a number, I asked, what does it symbolize? Now, it's, it's more the digits themselves, not the order of the digits. Because we have 276. What's 276? We have 627. So we have these different order of these digits. 627, that's going to be um, the end of the 350 years. That's where we're going to count the 40 years in Ezekiel's prophecy. Seven, uh, that two, uh, 276, that's going to be the number of people on, on the boat that are saved, including the three. Uh, Paul, um, I can't remember all the Aristobulus and um, and um, who's the other guy with Paul? Luke. Luke and our star. Luke. Yeah, Luke, right. Okay. Right. So so we know that that's part of this prophecy as well. So so obviously we have that that number there. But I think the most significant thing there is the February 15th date. That we can attach that to. Um, to this structure. And. um So when we attach that, um, so just looking here, I know I'm doing a bunch of things. I wanted to start drawing this on the line, but I guess we still have to study this further. Um, So when we count from Stephen's birthday to this February 15th, 1989, uh, we have the number 7309 days. So uh, the interesting thing about that, it connects us again to um, Daniel 11, verse 6. And the end of years, that word, the end of these years is 7093. So it's a different order of digits instead of uh, 7093 like it is here. In Daniel 11, verse 6, the number of days is 7309. So the 3 is going to be moved over. I take the second place in those digits and the 09 to the end. But I think that's significant as well, because we've already connected Stephen's birth to these lines, right? Okay. So it just gives us more symbolism connecting not just Stephen to uh, 9-11, but also to uh, 1989, right? So that, that ties this together as well. Um, I know there's, uh, even when the kingdom shall be divided, it's 2673. So we have that 267. We just have that three at the end. Um, and there was some other things that I was doing as well. Um, let me see here. So, 
191 years between February 15th, 1798, or, or 1780, what am I doing? Yeah, between February 1798 to February uh, 15th, 1989. So 191 years between these two dates, 1989, uh, and, or 1998 and 1989, 191 years. Is that significant, Dwight? When I'm seeing 191 years, I'm also thinking of 911. Right, and you already oh, did. My. Yeah, and you did the study on the the 191 because that year BC is is what year? Was it 191 BC? I'd have to look back, but I recall it, yes. Yeah, and that was the center of uh, the 343 years, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was a significant number in the 2300 days, as Stephen had pointed out. Um, in, in the 70 weeks, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so in the 70 weeks. So again, we have this, this symbolism attached to these February 15th. So we have to take them as significant. And it would help establish that this, uh, that this verse is, is addressing that, right? That this is addressing the fall of the Soviet Union, verse four. Now, now, just getting back to the idea that this is the king of the south. So it is the king of the south in our lines, right? But the king of the south does not show up in this line until verse 5. So, so I don't want to get confused between what the king of the south is symbolizing in this line and what it's symbolizing in our line. So, yes, we can say the Soviet Union is the king of the south. It's definitely not the king of the north. But the king of the south is a characteristic that is not just attached to the Soviet Union or Russia. It's a characteristic of the dragon power, right? It's a characteristic of atheism and licentiousness. That is the UN. So in 1989, the king of the south is the UN after the fall of the Soviet Union. So Gorbachev, what's he going to do after he uh, quits as the president of the Soviet Union? He goes to work for the UN. And he goes to work for the UN, right? So, so that the UN becomes the power now. The Soviet Union is not the king of the South anymore, right? So the king of the South is the UN. And, and that's so in this line, when we talk about the king of the south, we have to talk about the UN. That's the globalists, because the fall of the Soviet Union is. Um, even though they're the king of the south in the bigger picture, they're not really the king of the south here because the king of the south is a characteristic that's going to result from the fall of the Soviet Union in this this narrative, this story. So the, the United Nations is going to be strong, right? Yep. And, and, and that's, what, that's what's being established. Now, the United Nations, of course, as an institution, is not really the king of the South either, because this is globalism. This is a principle that's being uh, spread abroad. And it's going to, and it says one of his princes. And maybe one of his princes does specifically refer to the UN, right? But maybe it's something else, and we haven't decided that because we haven't discussed verse five really in much detail. Um, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. So, so I would kind of think that this is something, some aspect of this this global power, globalism, but. But the, the idea of the king of the south, this is, is, is broader than the prince, one of his princes. 
And it says at the end of the years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north. So the king of the north being the United States and this king of the south. Uh, we know that in 2001, there's a change that happens with the United States and its relationship to the globalists. Now, this continues to expand, right? When we look at what happened in 2020, that is a result of what happened in 2001. Because we had uh, a dissolving of freedoms in the United States and, and a continual control, uh, a push for control by the globalists over the United States. It's been going on for a long time, but definitely 2001 is instrumental in setting up what's going to happen in 2020. And then what we see happening, you know, with uh, the end of Trump on, on January 6, 2021, and the takeover of the United States by the globalists. So, so this is something that's expanding all through this history. But, you know, we have certain dates or way marks that we mark uh, to establish this. So here in this history, in these verses, we should be able to see connections and symbols to our lines that we have already. So we have things like, you know, 2001, and then we're also going to have November 9th, 2019. We're going to have, you know, July 18, 2020. We're going to have December 25th, 2021. All of those symbols should be in here. It should be illustrating that history. So verses from verse three, I guess, technically, to verse six should be illustrating that whole history from December 24th, 1979, all the way up to our time in some ways. And, and the symbols that we have here, uh, of course, are the usual symbols of what these things can symbolize, what a daughter symbolizes, what the king of the north, king of the south symbolize, uh, but also the Hebrew numbers. And there may be other things that we haven't considered. Right. So, so we probably still have a bit of work to do on this. But I do think next week we can start drawing this on a line and try to show this, try to show these spans of time and these different numbers. Um, so, and even like the word divided. So what's the word divided mean? Verse four. You mean split? It means to cut in half, right? Now, it's going to be cut in half towards the four winds of heaven. So, so literally, I mean, it's going to be cut in two, right? It doesn't say it's cut into four pieces, right? Because the word divided doesn't mean to cut into four. It means to cut into two, but towards the four winds of heaven. So, you know, obviously things can be divided and then divided and divided into smaller and smaller, smaller parts. Um, but it means to cut in two, which is a chiasm, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so it should, is his kingdom is going to be broken as well. Well, Shabar, it means to break down. It means to burst literally or figuratively. So this is, is sort of um, not just like shattered in the sense of something that's that's broken into pieces, but actually something that just totally bursts, breaks, you know, it can be broken into pieces as well, but crush, destroy, hurt, quench, quite tear, uh, right? So, so it has these, um, what happens when his kingdom is broken, it's, it's destroyed, but it's going to be divided or cut in half towards the four winds of heaven. Um, now, we also think of divided as, in a, as a mathematical term, right? 
correct? So, um, so if we cut something in half, uh, so it's going to be broken, which is seven six six five, and um, now if we cut that in half, we have a period of ten years, and. Um, 180 days, so uh, so 10 and a half years. <clears throat> now, does, is that significant? Can we use that, the brokenness, and divide it in half? And then we have uh, towards the four winds of heaven. And four winds, uh, if we add these together... Uh, we get the number 8,009. Uh, 8,009 is uh, 21 years. It's almost 23 years. Uh, or 22 years, pardon me. Okay, somebody had a comment? You might have heard my chair moving. Oh, okay. Um, so we got, uh, so we got, uh, okay, so 20, I'm trying to think here, so 20, I'm just looking at my math, trying to figure out this all out. Uh, well, that's why I'm looking at the wrong part. So in reviewing my math here, uh, we have 10 years, uh, 20. So I'm going to put this all together. So I'm going to take these two numbers. Um, so we get 8,009. And we also have uh, the number, uh, what did I do? Yeah, 3832. I know I'm doing some math here. And I don't even know if this is going to work out or not. Um, so if I add those two numbers together, I get a number 11,842, just rounding up the half, half of a day. Um, now that's going to be... Uh, 58 days less than 11,900. So this is going to be 32 years and five months, basically. So I don't know if that's significant. We're kind of running out of time. But I think that there is something here that we need to look at in this, this kingdom being broken, divided, and uh, added to the four winds of heaven. So I'm looking at this as a mathematical equation. That broken, this kingdom that's broken, is divided. So I divide that by two. And and instead of toward, the to the four winds, right? And, and so that's how I'm going to address that. Okay? Make sense? So we're going to look at that on Sunday. But I think it's a mathematical formula. Maybe that's just me seeing things that aren't there. But it's going to give us some information regarding this period of time. Now, um, and just to sort of finish that off, so I can kind of finish this off, I think, because we have uh, this number, which we said was 11,842. And if I count from, I'm just going to count from uh, here. So okay, that's going to bring us to April twelfth, twenty twenty two. 
Okay, so it's interesting. So if we count from February 15th, 1989, so yeah, follow me here. Uh, so if we count from February 15th, 1989, and we count to July 18th, okay? So I'm going to count uh, 11,000, um, and I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to just do the half day, so I'm not going to round it up. I'm going to do 11,841 um, days. So I'm going to show you what I'm doing here. Um, so you can see it. <clears throat> okay, so. So this is uh, the program. So I just said we have a mathematical formula, right? And here's July 18. You can see that there. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So we've got July 18, 2020. And I'm going to subtract 11,841 days. Oops. I'm going to have to subtract that. So that's just going to show me this date. And oh, I guess I'm supposed to do 42. I did it backwards. Okay. So this is going to bring me to, we'll do it this way. So I rounded it up. Right? It meant better. So if I go to February 16th, this is 1988. That's the problem. Okay. So it doesn't bring me to, it brings me to 88, not 89. So if I go to 89, I have to go one year further. There's the problem. Let me go one day here. So if I go from February 15th, 1989, it's going to bring me uh, 11,841 days. And it's going to bring me to July 18th, 2021, not 2020. Okay. Is that significant or is that a miss? Now, if it had gone to July 18th, 2020, that would definitely be a hit. But... If it's bringing me that many days, so what that's doing is it's taking the word broken, dividing it by half, and adding it to the Hebrew numbers for four wins. So any comment on that? Is that significant? I'd have to consider that. That is interesting, though. Yeah, so so it's just an attempt at, at you know, saying, here we have a mathematical formula. It's going to bring me from February 15th, 1989, to July 18th, but in 2021, one year later. So we have to figure out what that means. Now, we have marked July 18th, one year later, um, because remember, we're going to have that study um on well technically uh i think it's on july 18th we have that study dealing you do a study and then i do a study the following day on july 18th showing you uh the hundred and was it the 161 days or something like that i can't remember how it worked so it's going to connect to that study anyway that week or that day which is significant. So we're gonna to have to look at that. So maybe there's some way in which this all connects, but that's where that's where we are for today. So let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the study that we have had this morning. We know that we are, are trying to understand these passages and um, our understanding is limited. I, I thank you for the participation of each person we know, Lord, that um, uh, we are struggling to to place this in the way that we we are suggesting. We know that there's something there; we just can't see it. And we pray that you can help us in our personal study to remove the barriers 
in our thinking, in our lives that hinder us from understanding your word clearly. So I pray for each person studying these things that you can guide and direct them, that you can bring us together again according to thy will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.